How myths are made? Well, look, this is something that's always fascinated me, sorting out the grain of truth from the mountain of stories. Fact-checking, I love that. And there's no bigger story in the world to check than the story of Jesus Christ, and probably none that... No story has been more important, really, and I think been such a force for good as well. And I speak as an agnostic. And, of course, on December 25, two weeks today... Most of us will celebrate Christmas. And my tree's already up. It's just waiting for the kids to come home from overseas. Just Sunday to go. Now, it's called Christmas because it allegedly is the birthday of Christ. But what does anyone really know about the man whose birthday we're all celebrating? Now, put faith aside. I'm talking about the historical Christ, facts that even non-believers can be reasonably sure of. And joining me as a friend, an author, and a most inspiring priest, the Reverend Dr. Mark Dury, an Anglican minister, an adjunct research fellow at the Melbourne School of Theology. Lovely to catch up with you again, seeing how you... This is the busy time of the year. Um, first of all, I don't want to presume, right? Let, let me make it clear. I'm not presuming that you don't think of anything... of Christ as anything more than the Son of God, and, but just speaking to an agnostic. Jesus existed. True? True. I think it's one of the best established facts about the ancient world. And that you, we get uh, corroborated, not just in the Gospels, but particularly in the writings of Josephus, who was a, a uh, Jewish historian and also served as the interpreter for the son, emperor's son of the siege of Jerusalem some four decades after Christ's death, correct? Indeed, yes. And other ancient writers as well. In fact, the Babylonian Talmud refers to Jesus. Does it? I yes. didn't know that. Yes. Right, so that bit's uh, really established. And just uh, to, be, to tell people uh, what Josephus wrote, he said, uh, There was about this time Jesus a wise man, for he was a doer of startling deeds, and he gained a following both among many Jews and many of Greek origin. And when Pilate, that's the uh, Roman ruler of Judea, at the suggestion of the principal men among us, Jews, condemned him to the cross, those that loved him at the first did not forsake him. I've taken away all the bits in Josephus's writings that people think Christians added later to make the story even better. That, uh, that would be historically correct, right? Yeah, I, I believe so. I, I, there's no reason to doubt the historical existence of Jesus. Where was he born and when? Uh, according to the accounts in the Gospels, he was born in Bethlehem and uh, the dating of it is tricky because there's a reference to a census that was taking place in Luke's Gospel and there's some doubt about whether or when that took place. 4 BC, I understand. That's the normal uh, judgment, is about 4 BC, yes. And uh, when people say Bethlehem, that some people say is a rewriting later to make it seem like he was born there in fulfilment of a prophecy. His hometown, though, whatever you think of that particular story, was in the far north of uh, Israel. In right? Nazareth, yes. Nazareth. He grew up in Nazareth. In the back blocks, really. That's right. With a funny accent. That's right. Speaking what? Speaking pr probably Aramaic as his daily language, but he would have also known Hebrew. He could read unpointed Hebrew. And he would have spoken Greek as well, because that was the, there were whole towns that were Greek speakers. He was multilingual, almost certainly. Now... Are there any records outside of the Bible what his message was? Um, not really. The, um, there's references to him being a, a miracle worker. Um, so there's references to his, some of the things he did, his death on the cross. But his, his message is really contained in the letters of the epistles, of those that followed him, and, and also People the Gospels. People who knew him, though? People who knew him. So the, the so earliest... Paul did not. Well, he, he knew of him. He'd obviously... Well, he had a vision meeting him, but he'd, he'd met with many people who knew him. So Paul, Paul was writing the, the 30, 20 years after Jesus. So it's about like writing about the fall of the Berlin Wall or 9-11. Or that was the time gap between Paul's letters about Jesus and Jesus himself. And as Paul said, there were lots and lots of people alive who knew him at the time Paul was writing. When he died... Well, we know he, he died on the... Uh, he was crucified. Now, what do we take from that? 
Well, he was, he was executed by the Roman authorities. Because so that was a Roman punishment, not a Jewish one. That's right. It could not have been a Jewish uh, um, action to have crucified him. It was the Romans did that. In fact, they reserved that right to themselves, especially to deal with um, people who they thought were guilty of sedition or trying to overthrow the government. So that would have been his crime, alleged crime. And that's, that's what the, the, the Gospels, that were, that's what the tradition reports, yes. And uh, when he died, now Josephus says there were still people quite... Um, still uh, following him. He had a, a... I understand... What do you understand to be the size of the congregation? Fewer than 200 at that time? Well, we have two figures. Paul said that he appeared to 500 people after he was risen from the dead, and some of them still alive. But it's reported in the Acts of the Apostles that there were 120 people uh, there in Jerusalem, as he'd asked them. So I think you could put the hardcore number at, at 120 followers. That's not many, because... What I find astonishing about that figure, 120, three centuries later, it's conquered the entire Roman Empire. It's become the official yes. faith of the Roman Empire. How on earth did it go from 120 people, very sad, their leader's just been executed, in Jerusalem of a Jewish sect, becoming a Christian faith in a whole empire? Well, there was their message. Uh, it's reported on the first day, the birthday of the church, Pentecost, that 3,000 people believed in the preaching. So there was a rapid uh, response of people believing and also the way of life. The way of the life of Christians commended itself to people in those times. They were, they were known for their ethics, their morality. They, they refused to expose children. They cared for each other. Their love was notable. So those two characteristics, their message of Jesus and the way they lived, uh, was very attractive to people. I understand it was particularly attractive to women, in part, for one, um, it preached against infanticide, exposing the child uh, if he didn't want it or the dad didn't want it. Um, and it's, uh, it was one that give, gave women a certain status that other faiths do not. It preaches equality of or dignity of every human life. Yes, I believe it does. Jesus himself uh, dealt with women very well and uh, um, hard to fault, really. And... Uh, uh, Paul also, although he spoke about the headship of men over women, he also said there's no male or female in Christ. So he, he said that we are equal before God in that sense. So I think um, uh, Christianity did lift up the... I mean, you have to remember that women were just purely chattels in, in many parts of the Roman Empire, possess, possessions, and um, they, they were considered almost like slaves. So, yes, Christianity did elevate the role of women, It's a liberating faith. I basically. believe so. And many aspects of our contemporary view of marriage, that a woman should give consent, for example, was the result of Christian influence on marriage practices. And one reason it managed to transition from, uh, from the Jewish area of the empire and the far uh, you know, east of, of the empire was that there were 10% of the population of the, uh, of, the Holy, of the Roman Empire at that stage were Jewish, including there were lots of Jews in Rome itself, so they could go through that network because most of their early uh, converts were Jews. Were That's not? an extraordinary figure, isn't it? Yes, the picture that we get in the Acts of the Apostles is that the church uh, spread, the followers of Jesus spread amongst Jewish congregations and then also amongst uh, a large class of people who are sometimes called God-fearers who follow Judaism but were not Jews. That, well, they, they, they believed that the God of the Jews was, was the true God, but they weren't actually Jews. So there are many Greeks who were uh, associated with synagogues all over the, the Roman Empire. I have a friend uh, who's converted and gone to your church recently. What is your message, main message, to those of us who aren't Christian for Christmas? Well, I think um, Christmas is about the joy of being saved. It's the joy of uh, the fact that God has intervened in our lives, that we are, we are broken, the world is broken, um, sin is real, uh, but God has an answer to that. He has a plan for that. And the reason why we sing with such joy all these Christmas carols is because the joy of being rescued, of being saved, of finding life instead of death is, is just a phenomenal thing. That Jesus is, 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 brings life to us. I was lost and now I'm found. Exactly right. That's something to sing about. Mark Dury, it's a pleasure catching up with you again. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Andrew.